one of the best reasons for studying the history of a, an event or a movement is that you very often can get some generalization out of it that helps you to make less mistakes in the future. And I hope that a course like this has pointed out some of the, the things that are good that work and some that don't work so well so that they can actually be useful to you sometime in the future. <clears throat> One of the things that struck me when I first started looking at the history of the college was the, the, the amount of politics that's involved in something like this. The, you tend to stay away from politics for on the university campus, but they affect what goes on there. The, the UW Regents had a tremendous effect on making the CALS what it is. And that was based on their belief that agriculture was really as much a profession as any other uh, way of earning a living. The Board of Regents was tremendously important in determining which direction the college would go. In the middle of the Civil War, the Morrill Act of 1862 established land-grant colleges. And you probably have heard plenty about these things, but in case you haven't, the idea was that uh, every state should be able to teach agriculture and mechanical arts, as opposed to, say, letters and science. And to do so, each state that was at that time already had, had statehood status got 30,000 acres per senator, so that's 60,000, plus 30,000 acres per each member of the house, varied from state to state, uh, in a one-time deal that allowed them to use the money to establish a new college or university. These two guys are responsible for it, so it's a second case where a couple of politicians had an enormous impact on uh, colleges all over, all over the country. The UW didn't automatically get this. In fact, there was a hot competition between UW and the colleges Ripon and Lawrence but the UW won and there was a lot of political wheeling and dealing that I haven't talked about in class, but you can sort of imagine what went on. This happened in every other state too, and in many cases the decision was to have the College of Agriculture separated from the College of Letters and Sciences, very often even in a different city. So for example, there's Michigan and Michigan State, Iowa and Iowa State, Texas and Texas A&M, A&M for Agriculture and Mechanical Arts, and very often these things are located in different cities so that they don't, the, the two collections of scholars don't really uh, interact very much. And one of the things that's made Wisconsin very unusual is that in the same town we have the College of Agriculture, the College of Letters and Science, the College of Medicine, Veterinary Medicine, Business. It's very unusual to have that. And I think that the cross-fertilization that has been possible because everybody was in the same place it has made Wisconsin a greater university than it would have otherwise been. Another political act that had a tremendous impact here was the Hatch Act of 1887. Hatch was a senator from Missouri, which established in Wisconsin and I think in every state that wanted it, an agricultural research station player. So that instead of just collecting information from farmers, there was finally an effort to actually go out and do experiments and see what worked and what didn't. Farmers were consulted on this and there, there, there are interesting books that describe the interactions between the, the, the so-called experts and the farmers who were the real experts. Uh, and you, you, you see that there was a lot of political give and take in this process. South Hall, by the way, was Ag Hall for a while. I don't know if you knew that. W.D. Horde, uh, whose memorial is at the end of Henry Mall, if you look towards, well, here it is right here. That's Horde. Horde was a politician of the first order. He was in the Civil War as a, as a soldier. He, uh, he began after the war to, to edit and to actually to publish a newspaper that's still published today called Horde's Dairyman. It had everything to do with uh, with dairy cattle, and it was the, the sort of the bottom line for a lot of people to read. <clears throat> there was a Wisconsin Dairymen's Association, and Horde, although he was uh, uh, not a farmer himself, he was the president of that group. 
he was the governor of this state for a while, and uh, because because he had the political clout when he was governor to do so, he changed uh, the the business of agriculture in Wisconsin, partly by creating this Dairy and Food Commission, which was like a Supreme Court for uh, deciding on the issues related to farmers and farming. You hear all the time when you hear about the Wisconsin idea, but it seems to me that the Ag School really does exemplify what was intended with the Wisconsin idea. Usually the way people say it is that the, the university should extend to the borders of the state and beyond, but this is another way that I think is interesting. It's actually a quote from some formal document. It says that the UW is, has two obligations, one to the government in the forms of serving in office, offering advice about public policy, providing information and exercising technical skill, and they have an obligation to the city citizens in the form of doing research directed at solving problems. Uh, and if a school could live up to those two things, it would be a, a great place. I think Wisconsin comes close. Henry Mall, uh, just outside the door there, is named for Dean William Henry, who uh, began the egg school program, the egg uh, educational program here, very early in the history of the egg school. One of the things he did was to start a farmers institute, a collection of farmers institutes where farmers met at various places around the state, reported their problems and their successes and their failures, and then together worked to figure out some way to solve those problems and then publish them and pass the books around to the state. Henry, when he was appointed the dean in 1880, uh, was charged with teaching agriculture, but there were no students. And I think I've told you in class that Henry went out and actually spent a whole year just going from one farm to the next to the next, asking what people needed and trying to figure out a way that it could be provided at the school. Here are these farmers' institutes. On the right is this long list of cities in which these took place. There were two or three day meetings. They, they were not organized by and dominated by UW faculty, but they really were farmers' meetings. 50,000 people attended them, and it was the beginning, really, of the prominence of the, medic, the uh, ag school. <clears throat> We've talked extensively about the Babcock Butterfat test as being the first really big economic impact in the state, uh, dairy, dairy farming. Uh, and one of the things that made this discovery more well understood and more widely practiced was <coughs> that Babcock organized a farm short course, Babcock and others here, farm short course, which is a series of lectures offered during the part of the year when farmers are least busy, so they could come off the farm for a week or so. The courses were in botany, chemistry, veterinary science. Uh, there was no tuition at all, so these were free to anybody who had the time to take them. They started with the very modest enrollment. By 1910, they were looking at practically 500 students. And the farm and industry short course still exists as a powerful way of uh, reaching uh, every part of the state with information about agriculture. You heard Paul Williams talk about his work with the Fast Plants program. And his is another example of how uh, the, the learning from the laboratory, which he did in the first half of his life, could be brought to the public way out beside the borders of the state. Paul has a program that's uh, been used by millions, actually millions of children. It's available in multiple languages, and uh, it's probably been uh, responsible for inducing a lot of kids to go into plant biology. Third point, scientific method works. Uh, this, this particular brass plaque is someplace up near the egg school, egg hall, but it recounts the time when uh, Russell, who was the dean at one point, Russell uh, had developed a technique that was supposed to be capable of detecting a cow with tuberculosis. And it was questioned by farmers that, that would need to use it. So he took the UW herd, large, valuable herd of cattle, 
did the test with them, found that they all had tuberculosis. And when people doubted that, they, they slaughtered every single cow in the, in the herd and did a post-mortem to show that they did, in fact, have tuberculosis. From that, that day on, I think, the, the school was taken seriously for research, not just uh, reports. <clears throat> I've told you about Babcock and the single grain experiment, but uh, this certainly led to uh, Babcock's fame and to the college's uh, authority. Here's an example of what was accomplished by research on campus or in the small agricultural uh, farm that they had. This is something from uh, notes collected in 1962 from, on the Arlington Farm, which is north of Madison. They look here at the amount of milk produced by cows that were fed with uh, alfalfa and brome grass that had been harvested at different times, early, middle, late in its development. And look at the difference that this shows. This is the number of pounds of milk a day. And all that's different is how much is the date of the harvest of the alfalfa. And there's an 11-fold difference in this. That's the difference between being a disaster for a dairy farm and uh, success. This kind of learning uh, made the egg school mighty popular among co cattle, uh, I'm sorry, among uh, the dairy farmers, and led to their willingness to support more research and to listen to more results. One of the things that's really striking when you look at uh, scientific papers from university people during this early part of the ag school was that there were a few departments, this college was smaller of course then than now, but those departments overlapped tremendously in the way their, their scientists worked together. There were papers from uh, four or five different departments, all at this, participants from four or five different departments. The alfalfa story is an example here that involved people from all these departments. And it seems to me that that's something we've lost now because the college has gotten so big that we don't talk to each other. We can't. We don't have time. We don't have uh, space to do this in our lives. It's a bad loss. One of the things I hope that you've seen by looking at the history of the college is that you, by tackling a practical problem, a problem in agriculture usually, you often stumble on something that's really very valuable that you hadn't intended to investigate at all. So the nutritional value of feeds was a very practical question in agriculture, but it led to the discovery of vitamins. The hemorrhagic disease of cattle was a tremendously uh, serious problem, practical problem for farmers, and it led its investigation to the warfarin and coumadin that now uh, and since then have been uh, incredibly valuable rodenticides and uh, treatments for patients at risk for blood clotting. Botulism that I talked about this week uh, started out being a curiosity, a mighty scary curiosity, and it turned out to be very helpful in medical terms. <clears throat> One of the things that I haven't emphasized, but uh, which I think is important, is that a lot of these very practical studies of animal nutrition, animal nutrition that is, ended up being valuable in human medicine. So the investigation here of niacin was really all about animals in the sense that the, the organism that they studied was dogs, but the minute they had niacin, there was suddenly a, a very important human uh, application. The study of copper and iron for uh, proper blood development started out because pigs grown on cement slabs had a, a, an anemia that couldn't be accounted for, and they finally found out that the, the copper that they needed wasn't available in the cement. We've talked about vitamin D and the way that uh, it, its cure of rickets is dramatic, iodine and its cure of goiter, the sweet clover disease, coumadin, I don't think I talked very much about amino acid requirements that were studied here, but that kind of a study led to the understanding of a number of human, fairly rare human diseases in which some component of the met metabolic scheme can't be handled. Phenylketonuric kids uh, can't break down phenylalanine, for example. <clears throat> this is another example of the, the way studies of animal nutrition 
impinged on human medicine when McCollum left here, which was 1917, I think. Uh, he didn't go to another ag school, he went to a medical school and he became a, a sort of a world authority on human uh, nutrition. Same thing can be said for Elvium. Elvium's work started out uh, with a modest goal, but uh, in the course of his research career, he became universally regarded as a first-rate enzymologist. He eventually became chairman of biochemistry, the dean of the graduate school, the president of the UW. And what he left us uh, after he died, much too young, was a tremendous volume of new experimental data on nutrition and dozens, literally dozens of people that he trained that went on to very distinguished careers themselves. If you have the time and want to just amuse yourself a little this summer with an old book, here's one I'd recommend, Hunger Fighters by Paul de Cruyff. He, uh, his writing was sort of breathless prose, but he hit the nail on the head when he talked about hidden hunger in the way that the, the several scientists, including Babcock, had participated in its discovery. If you haven't already seen this, I hope you'll take some time eventually to wander over across the street, down the first floor to the far end, where this large mural by John Stuart Curry hangs. I've showed you already that the mural uh, had on the right animals and people that are healthy because they've had good nutrition and so on. On the left, there are animals and people who are unhealthy because they've lacked some nutrient that's essential. In the back, you have these scientists who have provided the new information that made all this possible. And then this mysterious pair of women who are really the center of the work of art, but who are not easily recognizable as, as these old guys are recognizable. And I've often wondered if these are not the two women who worked with McCollum in the discovery of vitamin A. <clears throat> there is a conference room that you, you can't get into normally because it's locked, but anybody who wants to see it, I'll be glad to conduct a personal mm -hmm. tour. It's a, it's a whole room. All the way around the room, there is a John Stuart Curry mural that includes uh, here, for example, uh, the ultraviolet light experiment with uh, Seenbach, who is and radiating food, milk, uh, to create vitamin D and to end rickets, essentially. <clears throat> this is the real guy. <laughs> this is the picture. There are, there are several other really interesting pieces of art around campus that you should see if, if you have the time. One of them is this farmer in the field. Uh, by also by John Stuart Curry. There are several versions of it, one a charcoal sketch, another a study for it, and then finally the, the serious thing. <clears throat> this is in the Elvin Museum now, and there's a replica of it, a perfect copy that hangs behind the Dean of, of College of Egg in her office. <clears throat> this is a John Stuart Curry painting that I'd love to have for myself, and I could probably have it if I were willing to give up several million dollars. It's a picture of Madison. Here's Lake uh, Mendota, Lake Monona, the capital. As far as I can tell, the artist is either standing in a cloud or somewhere up high. I don't, I don't know where you can get that high on the south side of Madison, but he did, apparently. <clears throat> I, I've told you that, that John Stuart Curry was a very unusual character in the sense that a school of agriculture had art hired an artist in residence. You don't normally expect that sort of thing to happen, but it has continued. So after Curry died, the college uh, hired Aaron Borod, uh, who, who was an internationally renowned, renowned artist. He <coughs> made covers for Time, for example, um, and had a, a characteristic style. I think I only have this one, but very often he would have a background and then show his person as a tear torn through the, here it is. Yeah. The background is torn and the student, the person stands behind it. <clears throat> this tradition has been kept up, some, some, in some cases by volunteers, 
and others have been hired by the College of Agriculture. But here's Dolly Ledeen, a woman that has just retired from the Center for Biology Education. I worked with her for many years. And Dolly uh, it was, is concerned about climate change and about uh, the changes in ecological situation that follows climate change. She took a group of artists to a retreat for a few days, I guess a long weekend, in northern Wisconsin a few years ago. They talked about uh, global warming and the impact on, on various aspects of agriculture and life in general. And then they all went back home to their homes and they made works of art, sometimes paintings, sometimes sculptures, sometimes other things, that represented their take on global warming. Then Dolly brought them back together again. The, the art from all of them was combined into a book called Paradise Lost and circulated all over the country uh, with a specific goal of having children see it. And wherever there was a display of this art, there was a, a program to have kids draw their own versions of global warming. And the art from Dolly's artists was displayed next to the art from the kids, and it was a smash success wherever it went. This is, this is some of the art that's in that book. Another very unusual addition to a faculty of agriculture was Robert Gard, who was actually a playwright. He not only wrote plays, but then he produced them all over the state. And uh, he further went on to train people to, fo to follow in his steps. He wrote books on his regional theater uh, and became uh, nationally renowned for his the plays and for the use of the playwriting as a way to understand rural life. <clears throat> Another generalization that falls out of a look at the history of this college, I'm sure it would be true for any college of agriculture, is that there is the potential for a really big economic impact when a school like this gets involved in research on practical problems. So I've talked about the Babcock Butterfat Test. Babcock also discovered that a practice that had been followed from time immemorial uh, to the present, namely curing cheese in warm temperatures, was not the best way to do it. They, he learned that you could cure it in cold temperatures and it was better, and this transformed dairy science here. Henry Lardy uh, learned how to stabilize bull sperm and created a multi-billion dollar uh, artificial insemination industry. Uh, Paul Williams told you about cabbage, cabbage wilt, which had completely wiped out a whole industry in this state. It was turned around completely by a simple selection of resistant cabbage. The, uh, the use of warfarin as a rodenticide for more than 70 years has brought countless millions into the coffer of wharf, but also uh, has saved farmers an enormous loss from rats that eat their crops. We didn't talk this, this time about forage harvester, but uh, the school, the uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering in the college was responsible for building a lot of the farm implements that you see commonly in a modern farm. And one of them was the forage harvester that was a transformation of the field. Most recently, I guess, the stem cells discovered by Jamie Thompson have uh, promised enormous ben benefits economically. Uh, when he announced the, uh, the technique that allowed one to get embryonic stem cells, the University of California, or the state of California, almost instantly announced that they were going to put $3 billion into stem cell research. And uh, that was, of course, a real challenge to the local people practicing this. So that's when the, the WID building was, was conceived and eventually funded. They, they couldn't let California outdo us, and so they built that very expensive building uh, as a result of that simple, that single discovery. We haven't talked in class very much about the, the parts of the egg school that are not life sciences, but there are uh, very famous members of the Department of Agricultural Economics and of Rural Sociology. Henry Taylor, who could easily justify a whole lecture, as often been called the father of ag economics, 
He wrote a textbook that was a classic. He worked at the USDA and developed uh, some of the guidelines at USDA that still exist. Otis was an animal husbandry type, but he, uh, he took the approach of an economist and uh, showed us, showed farmers how to use their resources in the most economical way. Galpin looked at, uh, he was a sociologist, and looked at rural societies, how they were organized, what the, uh, what the pecking order was, and so on. And uh, his textbook also was a classic. Hibbard looked at land management, and uh, the land center that we have here now, still, is a leftover from his work. And there were, of course, the artist, Curry, and the conservationist, Leopold, all of whom uh, made really important contributions, but not of the biological sort. Another generalization that falls out, if you look at a lot of research, and sort of separated into factors that were important, very often a field uh, sort of lies dormant for years for lack of a certain technique or instrument. And then when somebody invents that technique or instrument, the field just explodes. This happens again and again, and we have seen examples of it here. The, the analytical balance was actually invented long before Babcock, but uh, the ability to measure things, to weigh things, is what made the, the European chemists able to, to do serious chemical studies to figure out what the composition of a compound was. Being able to measure something is the first step in being able to study it. McCollum's introduction to rats, huge transformation of the nutritional science community. Lederberg invented a very simple technique that allowed one to select in a single overnight experiment a mutant that was unable to make uh, some intermediate. Laurie, I've told you about uh, who for in just a very short period of his graduate years stabilized, found a way to stabilize bull sperm and transform that industry. Truog and soils uh, figure out a way to build a kit that you could, here it is actually, that you could carry around the field with you and, and know from that kit's testing of the soil where you had problems with acidity and how you could fix it. And that, that had a huge impact on uh, the studies of, uh, of acidity on the growth and yield of plants. Bob Burris, who was a member of the biochemistry department, uh, was the one who figured out how you could actually measure nitrogen fixation. The, the single most limiting factor for plant growth, agricultural plant growth, except for water, is the amount of ammonia that they can get. And their nitrogen comes directly from the air, where it's in the form of, of uh, N2, a very stable and biologically loose, useless compound, which by some few organisms can be transformed, fixed into ammonia. And Burroughs figured out how to study that. The nitrogen fixation uh, literature is all about Lake Mendota, which was a test site for a lot of these studies. And uh, you could look at the literature. The minute he had introduced this mass spectroscopy for studying this, the field exploded here and elsewhere. <clears throat> The patenting of research findings has been a problem here since the original finding by Babcock that you could make a test of butterfat milk. Babcock lived at a time when it was not considered good form for people who are in science to profit from their discoveries. The idea was to make everything available to the public as a gift. Uh, and Babcock later regretted this partly because Without a patent, you, were no, you, you couldn't stop somebody else from building a cheaper knockoff of your machine and then ruining the reputation of the method by, by using a, a bad machine. So after that experience, when, uh, when uh, Steenbach discovered how UV irradiation could produce vitamin D, Wharf was founded. The proceeds from this process licensed out to various food makers filled Wharf's bank account. They now have $3 billion in the bank. 
uh, and uh, so that set the stage for warfarin's discovery and its ex exploitation as a rodenticide and as an anticoagulant. And again, millions of dollars flowed to the university from this. Uh, after Steenbach uh, died, his last graduate student, DeLuca, took over and uh, took the, the discovery of vitamin D's synthesis down to the place where you could explain vitamin D's action at the molecular level. In the course of making that uh, series of studies, Hector DeLuca uh, synthesized a number of vitamin D analogs that turned out to be medically useful. This spun off several companies that still are making good money. It's, it's, uh, it's very striking that this uh, spinning off of patents has made a big difference to the UW. I told you that Botox had not been patented, and uh, the university doubtless wishes they had. I looked into this more after my lecture and discovered that there is a form of Botox that the UW did get a patent on, but it seems not to be widely used. Gobin Carano was a colleague in biochemistry, one of the nicest people I've ever known, modest and quiet and brilliant. He won the Nobel Prize for his work on synthesis of DNA. And everybody who knew him and knew of his work agreed that the technique we call PCR, polymerase chain reaction, the technique that allows you to, mag to amplify DNA of very small amounts so that you can then study the sequence of the DNA, was really his discovery. But it, he didn't, it was, it was much too modest to think about patenting that. And the person who did, uh, one, won the Nobel Prize, and two, made a ton of money. Karana also won the Nobel Prize. If you look around Madison now, uh, on the west side of Madison, there are uh, places like the Research Park that are filled with companies that are startups that have proceeded more or less uh, into the actual production of profits. And uh, each of these companies has potential to get a compound ready for market, and then some big company comes in and buys it. The last one that I knew of, uh, was bought out for $400 million. That's the kind of money that's involved in these, these things. So the question of should you patent scientific findings has been resolved. Yes, you should, unless you're stupid. But it, it still seems a little bit wrong. The, the um, research that leads to a lot of these discoveries is not privately financed. It's financed by the government, which is to say by your taxpaying parents and uh, it, it, it would seem somehow that they should profit from the results of that research, but that's not the way it works. I haven't emphasized in talking about the research here the, the many cases in which there's a real legal and sociopolitical problem, but there are many of those things. I think when I first came to the campus, or very shortly thereafter in the 70s, maybe early 80s, the big problem for uh, agricultural research was that they had discovered here and elsewhere that bovine growth hormone could be injected into cows and made them bigger and they yielded more milk and every, in every way they were better. But this was a, a growth hormone that was not natural to them and some organizations on principle said, I won't touch anything that's seen bovine growth hormone. And other people who had scientific concerns and objections, also refused to do this. And there was a big bro aha about uh, whether growth hormone in milk was going to be a real problem for human consumers. We've seen several lectures here about genetically modified organisms. And I can tell you this has also been an incredible headache for agriculture, agriculture schools. There was uh, an effort that began here I think nearly 50 years ago, to breed potatoes that didn't get the potato blight, the blight that was so devastating uh, in Europe. Uh, and all, it was also a problem here. And lots of plant breeding went on. The potato plants from the Andes were uh, crossed with potato plants from over here, and uh, various progress towards making plants less susceptible to blight were made here. But the real leap forward came when one of the scientists in agronomy engineered, 
put a gene in that absolutely blocked blight. Any potato that had that was not going to get blight. You would think that such a discovery would be followed by lots and lots of financial success, but it turns out that the, the largest consumers of potatoes in this country are McDonald's for potato chips, I mean french fries, and uh, there's another company in Oregon that makes tater tots, something like that. Anyway, both of these big companies, the, the biggest market for potatoes, will not touch a genetically modified organism. We didn't talk in class this time about the Bayh-Dole legislation, but let me tell you just a little bit about this. Uh, when in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, people discovered potentially patentable things, compounds, processes, and so on, that had been discovered while, on, while working on a federal grant, there was a, uh, an embarrassing block that the discoverer couldn't go out and patent these things, but the supporter, which was the National Science Foundation or the NIH, uh, had no interest in patenting these. They, they didn't want to get into the patenting business. And there, was, there came a time when there were hundreds of potentially important compounds sitting on shelves waiting to be patented with no, no patents issued. No company will touch a, a process or a compound that is not patented because if you put all your money into developing it, somebody else could come along and wipe you out. So these critical and useful things are sitting on the shelf and that's when Hector DeLuca's vitamin D stuff began to yield uh, potentially very profitable results, and he too was financed by the National Institutes of Health, so it was public money. But the, the congressman, uh, Birch Bayh and Dole, together proposed with the help of UW economists, the Bayh-Dole Amendment, which uh, allowed uh, universities that did state and federal finance research to profit, to, to profit from those things by patenting them. The government foreswore any interest in them, and suddenly these things all came off the shelf, and the, the, the companies in this area suddenly got interested in exploiting these compounds. So it, made, it broke a big log jam and has led to the production of things that we needed or we profit from, and there's also money involved. The embryonic stem cell story is familiar enough to you, so I won't trouble you with it, but I can assure you that an awful lot of hand wringing went into the, how to treat this, this process of getting em human embryonic stem cells. And there still is all kinds of serious uh, debate about who should be allowed to do what, charge for what, and so on. One of the companies that often pointed out as an example of the right way to do things uh, is Promega, which began as a single person. He was a postdoc in biochemistry, who recognized a single need a certain enzyme that was being used in biotechnology, and who developed a process for making that single thing economically so that he could sell it at a profit. He eventually was joined by several other people, and eventually Promega became a thousand employee business, the branches all over the world, huge numbers of uh, products that are sold, 145 patents I see here. <clears throat> but even Promega, has had its economic problems and legal problems because anytime you start to use uh, a basic technique to apply to a lot of different processes, the technique is patented, but its use in these other things is not, and the company has had to defend itself, defend its patents again and again and again. Big ten, hundred million dollar lawsuits. So they've been embroiled in, in, in legal stuff almost from the day they started. CRISPR is a technique that has suddenly hit the life science community. It's a way to alter the genes of any organism you want to alter. Ridiculously simple, cheap, easy, dangerous, and uh, it poses huge legal problems because it's already being proposed as a way to treat children with genetic diseases. I've told you that the UW had some uh, significant influence over 
some natural, some national developments, and in particular, I mentioned Baldwin and Fort Detrick. Here, this picture I didn't show you, but this is a five million liter fermenter. Believe me, that's a big one. <coughs> I also didn't tell you that Baldwin is the grandfather of Tammy Baldwin. Ken Raper, I told you, worked at the regional laboratory in Peoria to develop pen penicillin. And that was one of those cases where the whole patenting thing was set aside. There was, there was such a need for the product itself that everybody, all the biotech companies, all the big pharmaceutical houses, all foreswore any profit motive. And they just went at this thing from every side and solved the problem quickly. <clears throat> Now another thing that I that I think you might have noticed in Paul Williams' talk, but I can sort of refresh your memory about this, is that for a long time at the University of Wisconsin, the way they hired faculty members was for a department to train a group of graduate students, and then when the department got <coughs> old, or somebody in the department got old, they would just hire the best graduate student from that department. And when that one got old, they hired the best one from the next generation. Uh, it almost always turned out to be a man, and uh, this old boy system practically shut out women, uh, and it also shut out uh, the possibility of bringing in variety from other places to keep a place alive. But it was effective for the period that we've talked about in this class. Here, for example, is E.B. Fred. He was a bacteriologist who became the president of the university. Here's Perry Wilson, his graduate student. Here's Bob Burris, his graduate student. And here's Paul Ludden, his graduate student. Four generations of people trained uh, in the same department, likely to continue doing the same kind of thing. And uh, there are many cases of this. I should say this is Elizabeth McCoy, who's one of the exceptions to the generalization I just made. She was a woman who was a very outstanding scientist. And she actually was connected with, uh, with Fred. The two of them wrote a classic uh, book about nitrogen fixation. These are uh, another example. Dak, Foster, Sugiyama, Shantz, Johnson. Five generations, all working on Botox. Paul Williams told you about this four-generation connection. Jones, Walker, Pound, Williams. And there are more. It's a very interesting. Uh, piece of history, and it has the obvious disadvantage that you you get this kind of incest leads to uh, a focus on one approach to science that is not healthy uh, to have. <clears throat> when the law changed, well, here's another example of uh, the, the kind of outstanding people that the UW had. The, uh, agri the field of agriculture has no Nobel Prize, but there is a Wolf Prize, which is essentially considered the Nobel Prize. And these four members of the college all won the Wolf Prize. Walker was a plant pathologist. Burris studied nitrogen fixation. Larry was actually a student of metabolism, but he got the prize for artificial insemination. And first was the beginning of a very pr uh, productive program here in reproductive endocrinology, which has put uh, the UW on the map in that field. I don't remember if I showed you this or not, but the result of the excellence uh, of the people in the 1930s and 40s was an awful lot of Nobel Prize nominations, not so many w winners. <clears throat> I also noticed when I was going through these things that although the conventional wisdom used to be that chemists and painters died young, uh, chemists, because they licked their fingers and sampled their compounds when they synthesized something new. Painters, because they breathed paint all the day long. But look at these, these longevity. It almost looks as if you want to be a chemist. I started out the course by telling you that it always dismayed me that students who had been around the campus for four years had no idea what any of these buildings were named for. I think we can, we can hope for this small group to have changed that. Babcock, Russell, Henry we've talked about, Hort I talked about today. Easter Day you heard, you heard in the flesh. I don't guess we've said much about King or Moore, but they were both uh, members of the Ag 
uh, uh, faculty, King invented the, the round silo, which turned out to be an important contribution to farming. Steenbach we've heard about, Smith. So you have no excuse now. You can't stumble around the university and not know what these things are about. Yes, you can if there's not a map. There, actually, there is a map coming. There, the, uh, the, the old guys that, that set up this course have also worked as a committee, and one of the old things the old guys have done, that we're proud of, is to develop a walking map of the whole campus. And uh, the, the map takes you from bronze plaque to bronze plaque. I don't know if you've noticed these around campus, but there are close to 30 brown glass plaques that commemorate something that took place in that area. So we have now a very nice walking tour, and we're trying to find out whether the university will pay to get this lined up on telephones so you can step up to any bronze plaque and hear the story. It's always interesting to try to predict the future when you've looked a little bit at the past. And it seems to me that several things are pretty clear about the future. One is that the departmental structure that we've had for all these years in the college won't, won't continue. It's because the, the field is so uh, split up into small units that none of the small units is able to, to operate economically by itself. So for example, we don't have a department of botany. We have horticulture, agronomy, plant pathology, soils, uh, each a small department, and now this year the dean of the college has asked these departments, has asked all of us to look at ways that we could actually consolidate several departments into one structure with one financial office, one so on. <clears throat> a change that has already taken place, I, I said that for many years, up until at least about 1970, Everybody hired from within, just as clear as could be, that was the policy. But in 1968 or 69, there was a government uh, proclamation that said, you can't do that anymore. It, made it, it required that when we hire people, that we make a serious effort to, to find them in a nationwide search. In my own department, what this meant was that up till 1965, every single member of the faculty was hired from within. After 1970, none was hired from within. It's a big, big change. <clears throat> the funding of research is actually a, a problem that all of us worry about because research itself has become more and more and more expensive, and the availability of federal funds to support research in science has, has not grown in the same proportion. We have in biochemistry, for example, just laid down several million dollars for a microscope that's part of a facility that will be able to determine the three-dimensional structure of molecules, proteins, uh, in a way that doesn't require their crystallization. It's a complete transformation of the way we do structure, but it's going to end up costing four or five million dollars at least, uh, and that kind of money is not easy to find anymore. One last thing that, that I think, well, I should, I should say two things here. The fundamental versus applied research, the, the pressure that we get in the ag school is that uh, the federal legislators want to see results. They want to be able to say, you should study diabetes, you should study potato wilt. And every one of us knows that the way those problems get solved is by fundamental research that eventually turns up the, the right answer. You can't target research like that. It doesn't work. Everybody can vouch for that. It doesn't work. But that's the way the government, uh, the funding agencies, want us to operate. Another real d d disjoint this, uh, between people doing the research and people paying for it, and in this case I mean the people who pay taxes, is that it's, it's hard for a scientist to explain to a, a sensible person why we study what we do, why we study worms and flies and bacteria and rats and mice and zebrafish when the real goal is to find things that help humans. This is again a, a, a problem of misconception, but it's a real bad one. 
when we years ago had a senator called Proxmire, Proxmire, Proxmire uh, was a good senator in many ways, but he was very tough on science in Wisconsin because he would pick each month a grant that had been funded by one of the federal agencies whose title struck him as facetious. And he would, uh, he would, in a big public display, award that person, that grant, the Golden Fleece Award, the, the way of fleecing the public in science. Uh, and he, he was one of the most, it was probably the most effective public relations thing coming out of Washington. It was incredibly powerful. There was a woman in Wisconsin in the psychology department who studied love. And boy, she just got slaughtered uh, by, by this Golden Fleece Award. Um, and it's still true that it's, it's very hard to explain why you would spend your time looking at a little tiny worm that nobody else cares about. And this is, this is a, a problem to be solved in the future. I think that uh, one of the things that we can accomplish with the museum that we're building is to show people the effect of focusing on simple creatures and using that information to extrapolate to, to uh, complicated ones. That looks like the end of my presentation. Thank you all for coming. And I hope I'll see you again sometime in the future. Can you entertain questions? You bet. I, I do recall um, a speaker early on in the semester saying, referring to the map of the bronze plaques. But what about a map of, for example, that will show us where the court statue is, these structures, and um, is it the Moore Hall uh, <coughs> and the, uh, another hall? By, where, where would, besides looking on a UW map itself, and, and <coughs> are they very good at maps? I think the one that we're developing is is as good as there is right now, and that doesn't that doesn't answer your question. It, yeah. It's it's way better than nothing because it does allow you to walk around all the way from Egg Hall West yeah. out as far as the dairy barn, and to see uh, and hear about thirty or so contributions. There's no such thing for the east end of the campus. And uh, these, these uh, things like the Horde statue, I, I think the Horde statue maybe is on our working, walking tour. Where, where do we find the, the map of the bronze plaque? I, I, I will give you a copy of it if you give me your email address. I will. Okay. So uh, the, the problem, this sounds crazy, but the, the old guys group has developed this thing. It's, it's up to date. It's ready to go. It's going to cost $500 to print these things. And we're looking all over for five hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. And then um, another question: You referred to Professor Hibbard. He, mm -hmm. There's some remnant or entity still existing, institute or something. That's the land tenure. Oh, uh, you mean the land tenure program? Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, uh, because I don't know the the sociology or the, the social sciences part of the college so well. I'm sure I have undersold, I know I have, but those have made important contributions. I mean, the UW's contribution towards the income tax program, the social security program, right. are very significant. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Question. Yes? Uh, many industries have now applied or tried to study artificial intelligence and their applications in their fields. Yes. Do you expect any future application of artificial intelligence in biological science yeah. research? Yeah, I, I think we can look for that. I mean, the the, um, the the artificial intelligence that we have now is teach is capable of teaching itself. It it does something. If it doesn't work, it changes the that until it finds something that works, and then it uses that. It's like the kinds of um, dictating software that we have. So you, you talk into a dictator, uh, dictating software, the first time you use it, it's terrible. But then you go back and correct it. You say, when I say this, you write that, and it now learns. And it actually gets to the point where it recognizes your voice, your usage, and some of these are just amazingly effective once you've trained them, or they've trained themselves. 
So yes, I, I think that there are there are things that we do that 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 a computer or a, a micro manipulator can do better than we can do, just because of, of stability of, 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 of the machine, for example. Uh, I don't think we're going to solve any great human events or human problems, but technical problems, yes, I think AI will, will do that. I just read a book uh, whose title I probably can't remember now, but it, it, was, a, it was a novel about uh, the future when a, a collection of physicians and money lenders had developed software that could diagnose human disease very effectively and it was going to cut a lot of the physicians out of the deal. And it was a self-learning thing. And one of the things that it taught itself was, unexpectedly it taught itself, that people who were 90 years old and had multiple problems were a bad investment, medically speaking, and so they should be terminated. <laughs> and so the, the gadget started terminating them. And this is an example of what what happens when you don't control the learning of AI? Yes. You know, I, I, this is kind of a big question, but um, because the the models of research that you've talked about in this course are um, based on so much history of uh, well, ways of doing things, mm -hmm. I just wonder not just about this university, but others uh, with um, significant uh, science departments uh, around the globe were on such a cusp um, of not just AI, but other, other kinds of technological mm -hmm. revolutions. I, I, it's just going to make our heads spin, and I just wonder sometimes if it's not that this kind of a revolution, a fourth industrial revolution, it's been called by some, mm -hmm. is not just going to sweep everything away and we, we won't be able to catch up in the way we're doing business now. Yeah, it, it is true that, that scientific advances have come faster than our ability to adjust to them. And to observe them. Yeah. In, in the university, we, we still use basically the techniques that were used 500 years ago to educate people, get them all in one room and talk at them. Yes. Uh, and everybody knows that's not the most efficient, that's not the most effective way to teach. Right. If you want to know what we really believe works, see how we treat graduate students. We put them in a laboratory with all the equipment that they need. We give them a problem and say, you're on your own. Come see me if you get a problem, if, if, if you want help. And then we spend a lot of time with them one-on-one. -on -one. That's the way to educate somebody. But that, that's simply impossible here. You know, <laughs> Every class is not the size of this one. Well, if I don't see you again soon, I hope you have a great summer. Thank you. Pass all your exams. <laughs>